Okay, this presentation uh, accompanies an activity where we'll be making DNA models out of paper. This is James Watson and Francis Crick, of course, who won a Nobel Prize for figuring out the structure of DNA. Um, here they're showing off their model to the public, uh, which was made of uh, tin and aluminum. Um, they actually began working on paper, as we'll see a little bit later in the presentation, and that's what we'll be doing too. Um, creating a DNA model given or using sort of post-it notes or index cards where we'll have the bases and sugar and phosphate on them. So uh, Watson Crick, of course, had predecessors before them. They were standing on the shoulders of giants, you might say. Uh, they knew quite a few things about DNA from the work of others. They knew the structures of the four bases, adenine, thymine, guanine and cytosine. They knew from Edwin Shargaff um, the way that the bases were paired. Uh, Shargaff extracted DNA uh, and analyzed or and determined how much of each base was in um, DNA from different species, humans, rats, chickens, all the way down to bacteria and viruses. And as you can see here, the amount of, let's say, A differs between the species, but across all species, A is pretty much equivalent to T and C is equivalent to G in terms of the percentage um, of these bases in DNA. It, so this suggested that a was paired with T and C was paired with G. So they knew there was some complementary base pairing there. Base pairing there. Um, then, of course, the work of Franklin, Rosalind Franklin, um, and Maurice Wilkins uh, had helped them understand the shape of DNA. Um, Wilkins and Franklin had basically used x-ray crystallography where um, they blast the crystalline forms of DNA with x-rays and it's refracted onto x-ray film and they determined through this famous photograph here uh, that the structure of DNA was helical. Alright, so Watson and Crick knew that. They knew um, what kind of sugar was in DNA, deoxyribose. Deoxyribose is called deoxyribose because there's one less oxygen in deoxyribose than ribose. Um, so we'll be focusing on the deoxyribose molecule. Uh, deoxyribose is a five carbon sugar uh, where four of the carbons are in this sort of pentagon shape with one oxygen and the carbons are, are labeled one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. And uh, knowing which carbon you're on is very important when creating the molecule to make bonds with other molecules. All right, so um, we'll be assembling our model kind of molecule by molecule. I guess you could do it atom by atom if you want, but in the real world, uh, in the real world of nature, uh, DNA is assembled nucleotide by nucleotide during DNA replication, and RNA is assembled the same way during RNA transcription. A nucleotide is a base, contains a base, a sugar, and this new group that we haven't talked about yet, the phosphate group, a phosphorus atom with uh, four oxygens around it. And you'll notice that the base connects from a nitrogen uh, to the one prime carbon in the sugar. Uh, and the phosphate above connects to the five prime carbon which is off the ring. Alright, so that's a nucleotide. So um, uh, <clears throat> be sure when you're creating your models that you put the right number of bonds around each element. And of course the number of bonds in a covalent bond where different um, atoms are sharing electrons uh, depends upon the number of electrons that are will fill up the last shell of those atoms. So uh, let's see, around hydrogen there needs to be only one bond, around oxygen two bonds, around nitrogen three bonds, around carbon four bonds, and even if you have double bonds, you know, that's still four bonds, and around phosphorus five bonds in all of these molecules. So uh, it's really useful to watch this great video from the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, the DNA Learning Center, uh, where uh, Watson describes the moment when he realized how much of the molecule fits together. Um, he 
basically was waiting around for the Cavendish lab to create tin models, so he made some out of paper and he started, you know, moving them around. This is an incredibly useful video to watch, and it's provided in the other materials for the class. So let's examine the base pairing. Here we see a GC pair and here's an AT pair. You'll notice that they're like the same width and that's important to keep the, the strands the same distance apart. Um, now this particular illustration here shows the chemical structures as skeletons. You know, organic chemists are a little bit lazy and when they can, you know, take a shortcut they do. Uh, and when they draw skeletal structures they owe, they leave out the carbon which is sort of ubiquitous in um, organic chemistry and also the hydrogens hanging off of the carbon. Um, now, uh, let's see, we have three bonds between the GC pairs and only two between the AC pairs, or AT pairs, that's a big difference. And these little squiggly lines here refer to which nitrogen um, is connected to the sugar in the bases. Now, um, for this activity I'm asking you to show me an AT pair and a TA pair, a GC pair and a CG pair, all four pairs, and you might think that you could just sort of rotate these 180 degrees to get that, but actually you need uh, to take um, mirror images. Yeah, that's right, so you have to flip it in your mind and then write the mirror images on the post-it note. So here we have the CG pair which is um, a, f a mirror image of the GC pair. And it's a little tricky when you're drawing all of these to figure out which one, um, which C goes with which G, but you can use this particular slide to do that. Okay, so now we're going to put everything together and show you basically what I'm looking for um, in this assignment. You're ne going to need to uh, show me all four pairs uh, and the sugars uh, and the phosphates around them. The sugars and phosphates alternate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, on each side of the molecule. So how many of each to draw? You'll need uh, one of each of the bases and then a mirror image of each of the bases, eight phosphates and then eight sugars. But the phosphates and sugars don't have to be mirror images. You can draw uh, eight of each of those and they just rotate, I'll show you. Okay, so when you're putting together the sugar and phosphates to make the backbone, uh, there's, you're actually taking away some of the elements that you would see if you were to see these molecules isolated. Um, so the um, carbon connects directly to an oxygen which connects directly to a phosphorus atom. Uh, from the three prime carbon and the extra OH of, from the phosphate and the extra hydrogen um, from the sugar just disappears as water and that's also true uh, when you connect the one prime carbon uh, to the base and the five prime carbon to the phosphate above. And so you'll need to look back at this to make sure you have the correct number of bonds around each element and that you're making things disappear properly. Okay, so uh, one other thing I want to talk about is the anti-parallel structure of DNA. If you'll notice on the left hand side of the molecule that all of the sugars are pointing up and you know if, if the oxygen is up and on the right hand side of the molecule all of the oxygens are pointing down. Yeah, so basically each strand is just a rotated version of the others. And you basically have, you know, this three-dimensional structure which is being squished into two dimensions so it doesn't quite work that well. Um, one place that it doesn't work that well, as you'll see in different illustrations uh, where you have um, these oxygen molecules that are attached to the sugars. You'll have adjacent ones or opposite ones and that really kind of means the same thing because you can imagine this um, This is more like a, a, a three-dimensional structure and if you wheel those uh, oxygens around it could look like they're opposite. So. Um, what else again? Okay, the, there are hydrogen bonds in the middle of the molecule. These are weaker bonds that enable the mo molecule to be separated. Uh, so those need to be specified by dotted lines. Note again, there's only two bonds between A and T and three bonds between C and G. You can see here when you look at um, 
you know, uh, each of these that they are mirror images of their counterpart, right? Okay, so you have to draw those. And then the reason that we specify the five prime and three prime ends of the molecule is to kind of keep them straight when we're looking at the code. And where we get three and five prime from is here. Um, this five prime end of the molecule is closer to the five prime here on each sugar. So there's a five prime, there's a five prime. All the five primes are pointing up, and the three primes are pointing down. And so this is the three prime end. And on the other side of this anti-parallel molecule, the three prime end of all the sugars are pointing up, and the five prime is pointing down. Okay, so here is an example of a finished project. I've kind of blurred this one so that you can't just copy it. You have to actually think about it and put everything together. Um, so I'm looking for you know all four bases, uh, both on the left and the right, sugars, uh, you know the the sugars and the phosphates, and then you'll you'll connect each of the submolecules with a covalent bond, which needs to be a solid line, and of course uh, hydrogen bonds in the middle, which needs to be a dotted line. And uh, anytime I see you in person, I may uh, on residential weekends, I will have a 3D. Uh, version of the molecule and you'll need to be able to look inside the molecule and f see the various parts, right? If before doing this activity you might just see this as some sort of double helix that's kind of a big mess inside, you know, of a bunch of gumballs that you don't really understand. But after doing this exercise uh, you should be able to identify um, thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. Note the number of bonds here between them. You need to be able to identify each of the elements um, and let's see, what else? Where's sugar? Where's phosphate? Uh, which bonds are covalent? Which bonds are hydrogen? You'll be surprised. Once you put this molecule together, DNA will make a whole lot more sense. And if you deeply understand the structure of DNA, then it's easy for us to understand the replication of DNA. And if you understand the replication of DNA, then you can understand sequencing and PCR and genetic engineering and all the other things that we do with DNA. Okay, so let me know if you have any questions.